So yes, uh, so welcome again for the to the communication and signal processing seminar. Uh, it's again uh, we have another external uh, speaker. I mean, external these days is anyone outside. Uh, <laughs> everyone is external. But anyway, uh, so it's so first before I get started, I should thank both uh, Shelley Felcam and Kate Goodwin for helping organize the seminar. And also KLA as well as uh, NCIS and SIPML areas for uh, helping uh, set up the seminar. Uh, so I'm delighted uh, that our speaker that we have, Alexander Proutier, speaking today. Um, I can tell you without hand that he's an excellent speaker. So we are all in uh, ready for an excellent talk. Um, so he's been a professor in the Decision and Control Systems Division at KTH Stockholm, Sweden since 2011. But before joining that, he was a researcher at Microsoft Research in Cambridge from 2007 to 2009, a research engineer at France Telecom R&D from 2000 to 2006, uh, invited uh, lecturer and researcher in the Computer Science Department at ENS Paris from 2004 to 2006. So he received a PhD in applied mathematics from Ecole Polytechnique. Uh, he graduated in mathematics from Ecole Normale Superior. I'll tell you a little bit about that. <clears throat> he also received an engineering degree from Telecom Paris and is an engineer from the Corps de Mines. Uh, he has won numerous awards. One of the things is the uh, ACM Sigmetrix Rising Star Award in 2009 uh, and several best ACM best papers at Sigmetrix in 2004 and 2010 and Mobihawk 2009. His uh, research interests are very broad. Uh, <clears throat> they are in probability and their applications. And right now, I mean, for the last few years, he's been concentrating a lot of machine learning, reinforcement learning uh, problems, especially bandits and looking at uh, reinforcement learning applied to dynamical systems. So just to, before I give him the, uh, the hand over the reins to him, I should just mention, well, one of the, I guess from his time at uh, Ecol Normal Superior, I think he intersected with Cedric Villani and Cedric Villani thereafter decided, hey, I'm just going to concentrate on mathematics. I don't want to do anything else. I cannot compete with Alexander anymore. Anyway, <laughs> Alexander, <laughs> the floor is all yours. Oh, thank you, Vijay, for the introduction. Yes, I was in the same class as uh, Cedric Villani, yeah, but uh, this was uh, exactly the contrary. There was so many bright uh, students in, in this class that I I really wanted to escape. <laughs> anyway, so thank you very much for the introduction and the invitation. Uh, today I'm going to talk about fastest uh, identification in linear system and I will essentially report the work of my uh, student Yassir Jedra. So let's see. All right. So. Um, so the talk is about learning in a linear system uh, with uh, targeted applications uh, in reinforcement learning and uh, adaptive control or identification in, in systems when there is an underlying linear structure. By the way, please feel free to interrupt me anytime. Okay. So at the first part of the talk, I will talk about uh, systems where you have uh, a control uh, a control problem with linear reward. So this is the case, for example, in uh, linear bandit optimization, where uh, the average reward for an action A, represented by a vector A, is uh, A transpose mu, uh, where mu is an unknown vector. Uh, this is a very popular model in recommender system, uh, or every system actually relying on online uh, matrix factorization. Another very popular uh, application uh, of uh, of uh, uh, and a very uh, application of system with linear reward is uh, when you try to do reinforcement learning in a Markov decision process with uh, with function approximation and in particular linear function approximation. So there to uh, fight the 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 to to, diminish, to reduce the dimensionality of the problem you assume that the value function or the q function on any function of interest would be uh, written as mu transpose phi of s s is a state 
uh, and then mu is the only parameter that you have to to learn. Phi is uh, is composed by a basis of functions that you choose a priori. So this uh, linear function approximation is very instrumental because actually you can act you can uh, choose the dimension of the vector mu, so you can really reduce the dimensionality of the problem as you wish. All right, so the goal in this first part will be to devise efficient sequential action selection strategies uh, for estimating mu or to find the best action or the best uh, arm or the best policy in MD. So uh, the second part of the talk will be uh, devoted to linear system with a uh, linear structure, but where the linear structures, uh, structure lies, lies in the dynamics of the system. So the, the second part will be on a very, very classical control problem, which is uh, system identification, but with a, with a new perspective, let's say. Uh, so you have a linear system, uh, AXT is equal to AXT plus BUT. This is the control variable plus noise. You observe the trajectory of the system and you try to identify A and B as quickly as possible. So this is the goal of the, the, the part two is, is to devise algorithm or that will efficiently estimate A and B. Well, in this case, for part two, we know what the, what the most, uh, we will prove actually is that the most efficient algorithm, even in finite time, is the least square estimator. All right, so there are many challenges in uh, these uh, two parts or these two kind of problems. Uh, essentially, uh, the, so solving these problems requires uh, the analysis of random matrices that are built from uh, dynamical systems. So here, uh, the dynamics uh, in the first part would be, let's say, in bandit optimization would be, what are the sequence of actions that I'm selecting? So this would be the dynamics. Uh, in the second part, the system itself is, uh, is generating, a, is, is dynamic. So, uh, the analyzing the performance of uh, algorithm requires us a good understanding of random matrices that are built from these dynamical systems. And uh, especially here, uh, the, the matrix of interest will be the covariate matrix. Uh, we have been working on other examples of uh, matrices built uh, upon dynamical system and in particular Markov chain. Uh, and we have been uh, deriving similar uh, result for Markov chains uh, in uh, other work. Uh, in addition to this uh, component, that is uh, the analysis of random matrices coming from a dynamical system, this are not easy because their entries are essentially correlated. The theory of random matrices have been mainly developed with entries that are independent. But here, since we are following a trajectory of the system and we are filling up the matrices, the, the matrix accordingly, these entries are going to be correlated. That's the main difficulty. Anyway, when, uh, when I come back to part one, where you, we have linear system with uh, linear reward, uh, and if we want to design uh, algorithms that select uh, sequentially actions in a, in a good way, uh, then uh, the analysis of such system requires us to combine and jointly analyze several ingredients, including random metrics, of course, uh, stopping rule and sequential selection strategies. So this is not, uh, these are the essential challenge uh, today. All right, um, before I start, I would like to me make a very important remark is that when you, uh, try to learn something, when, when you try to devise an algorithm to learn, uh, you essentially, if you look at the literature, you have two kinds of uh, guarantees. You have, and this is true also in, in general in statistics, you have minimax uh, guarantees. So essentially you uh, try to have guarantees over a set of system and the guarantees are going to be uniform over this set or you have more precise instance-specific guarantees. So you fix the model. So for example, you fix uh, the vector mu in the linear bandit optimization, and you try to uh, 
to derive uh, the optimal algorithm for this particular mu, even if you don't know mu. So uh, I think that having a minimax approach in learning is uh, catastrophic. In general, uh, so th this is the picture that you, you, I, I can show. So essentially in the x-axis, I show the model. So for example, uh, the mu uh, in the linear bandit optimization problem. And you assume that mu covers a big set uh, of uh, capital phi. Minimax uh, lower bound generally are very high uh, if they exist. Sometimes they don't even exist. Huh? So um, the minimax lower bound are generally, they are constant over phi because they essentially don't depend on the model. They, they take, they are valid for the worst possible model. And then when you have an algorithm that is minimax optimal, you just uh, say that the algorithm is reaching this uh, performance, this minimax performance limit. Now, if you look at instance specific uh, guarantees, you see that of course, the time it takes for you to learn or the error rate that you have on a statistical inference task strongly depend on the model. There are models that are very easy to learn and your algorithm should learn, learn it with very, very, very small error. And so instance specific uh, guarantees are much more precise and they are essentially essential. Uh, because if you have a, an algorithm that is uh, instance specific, let's say optimal, then you are sure that the algorithm is optimal for any statistical model and it's essentially adapting to the, mo the model that is currently learning. Okay, uh, so what I write here is that minimax error lower bounds come from very wacky example. Yeah, I mean, the, the minimax lower bounds are generally derived using very crazy example of systems that you will never encounter in reality. And I, I maintain that they are often meaningless. And there are many people just, I mean, as a, as a community in machine learning, many people just stay with the minimax framework. Uh, and this is a, a big mistake in, uh, according to me. All right, so before uh, I, I will now uh, move on to the first part of the talk, which is devoted to uh, the problem of best arm identification in linear bandits. So what is the problem? Uh, the problem is that uh, we have a set of arms or action that is a subset uh, A of RD, okay? Uh, A, the set of arms can be finite or continuous. I will start with the finite case and say a few words about the continuous case. And uh, the idea is that uh, we have of arm A uh, in round T would be R A, R T of A, which is mu transpose A plus noise, where mu is the vector of interest and is essentially not known. Uh, in this first part, I will assume that the noise is Gaussian, okay, and I, I And this plays a role when you uh, look at the formulas. But of course, the, 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 the parameter mu, the vector mu is unknown so that you don't know which arm has the best expected reward. So the role of the game is that the decision, the learner is going to interact with the system at time t is going to propose an arm AT. And then in, in return, in feedback, he will get a sample of the corresponding reward. Um, the goal is to uh, learn as quickly as possible what is the best arm, what is the best action. So uh, we study uh, this problem in a fixed confidence setting. So it means that we design a sequential arm selection strategy, AT, a stopping rule tau, and a decision rule, uh, a, a hat of tau, returning the best arm with a fixed level of confidence. And maybe with minimal sample complexity. So essentially, huh, you are selecting sequentially the actions. Uh, when you gathered enough uh, data, you uh, say, oh, that's now I can stop and return what I think is the best arm. 
And uh, we are looking at the fixed confidence setting. It means that uh, essentially we are looking at a delta pack algorithm for finite set of arms. So an algorithm that is, uh, is, is delta pack is for all possible vector mu, the probability that I don't return the best arm is smaller than delta. So the error rate is smaller than delta. So after uh, when I return the, the, my estimated best arm, I have the best arm with priority one minus delta. If you have a continuous set of arms, then you have to move to what we call epsilon delta pack algorithm, which means that for all parameter mu, the probability is that the arm that you return is epsilon suboptimal, or is epsilon optimal should be bigger than one minus delta. So Alexander, just a yeah. quick uh, clarification yeah. or not. So this is just sample complexity. So you're not in, so you don't care how much regret you accumulate while uh, exactly. learning. Yeah. So uh, sample complexity in the <clears throat> problem specific uh, framework is much more difficult than regret. <clears throat> and there, there is a good reason for that, but I, I, maybe we can discuss that later. Uh, <clears throat> Okay, so what are the what yeah, is the related? Uh, can I ask a quick question? Yes, sure. Late here. Yeah. So, uh, why are you interested in this uh, fixed confidence or uh, setting instead of looking at like asymptotic, like as you're getting more data or try to make the error <clears throat> smaller, smaller? Uh, so, so there are two settings: a fixed confidence and fixed budget. So, the fixed confidence setting is uh, easier than the fixed budget. Uh, it's, it might be paradoxical, but maybe, uh, okay. So uh, you can uh, actually, even in, in uh, the classical multi-arm bandit problem, uh, the last open question is what is the optimal error rate uh, when time goes to infinity of uh, the optimal algorithm for identification in the fixed budget setting? So in the fixed budget setting, you have a time, you have a finite number of, uh, you have a finite budget, and then you try to, uh, after this time to uh, essentially output the best arm. Right. And this is, uh, this is a much more difficult problem. Uh, <clears throat> and it's still open. So, um, yeah. So I, we, we, could, we could also discuss this uh, later, but it's, uh, it's something, um, it's actually very easy to look at the performance of algorithms that have a fixed allocation asymptotically. So it means that, well, over time, over my time budget, I will uh, play this arm that, many, that, that proportion of time. And if this is fixed, then you can principles that tells you what is the asymptotic um, performance of your algorithm. Now, the problem is that if you try to optimize over this allocation, uh, then the optimized allocation will depend on the parameter mu, uh, the, 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 the average reward of the various arms themselves. And it's not clear that actually, um, the problem is that you have to identify this, this uh, average reward of the various arm to be able to find the best allocation. Mm -hmm. So, but you would like to find this best allocation because this would be, this would lead to the smallest error rate. So as of now, it's, it's very difficult because you have two estimation problem that, that you need to solve jointly. And this is, uh, this is open and very difficult. Uh, I know that uh, uh, there, are, there are some people in Stanford, what's his name? Uh, Okay, I'll, I'll figure it out later, but it's a difficult problem. That's okay. why. <laughs> I'm okay, thanks. completely honest with you. We, we found fixed confidence setting because it's, uh, in a sense, easier. Okay. All right, so what is the related work uh, considering uh, linear bandit? Uh, linear bandit were introduced by our in uh, 2003 and first, uh, let's say, studied by Danny, Eyes, and Kakada in 2008. And uh, it, it became extremely popular model after the paper of Li Chu, Longford, and Shapir in 2011, 
where they showed that recommender systems can be modeled as linear bandits or contextual linear bandits. When it comes to linear uh, best arm identification in linear bandits, uh, these are the only paper existing uh, beyond our paper. Uh, I think the first guys to study it was uh, uh, Soar, Lazaric, and Munoz in 2014. Um, essentially, all the work that you are listed here have uh, many drawbacks. Uh, and one of them uh, that we want to, to, to solve here is that they have a strong dependence in the number of arms. So the number of arms is K. So sometimes the procedure, most of, uh, most of these, these guys propose algorithms that depends on K. So because, for example, it's a successive elimination process. So essentially, you eliminate, you, you work in phases, and you, after each phase, you are going to eliminate one arm that you think is, going, is not going to be optimal. And so uh, this uh, suffer from the curse of dimensionality, these, these, all these algorithms. And they are, uh, they are generally not optimal uh, in the sense that they, they don't reach what we are the, the, the problem specific sample complexity lower bound. And also often it's uh, people are studying the sample complexity um, with high probability and not in expectation. And in expectation is, is much more difficult. All right, so our objective was to uh, essentially devise an algorithm that is optimal, both almost surely and in expectation uh, when it comes to sample complexity. An algorithm that is easy to implement. We don't want to have phases. We don't want to have doubling trick. Doubling trick is just a, a theory trick. It, it's never work in practice. And we importantly want an algorithm that would be completely independent of the number of arms, okay? So because if you think of the application of recommender system, uh, you may uh, try to recommend uh, within a set of uh, one or two million uh, items, for example. So if the set of arms is scaling like this, uh, you, the, the, the if the algorithm or its sample complexity depends on K, then you are dead. So to this aim, uh, we will uh, exploit uh, Gary V. Kaufman's approach that they, they, they did for classical multi arm bandit problem without the linear structure. That's to say that we are going to first uh, try to derive a lower bound on the sample complexity, and then try to essentially track um, the allocation leading to this lower bound to devise an algorithm. All right, so the first step is an instance specific sample complexity lower bound. So imagine that for now you have a finite set of arms and um, you consider a delta pack algorithm. So an algorithm that returns uh, the best arm with probability one. So uh, the first step to derive lower bound is the very classical change of measure, uh, uh, change of measure argument coupled with the data processing inequality. And this is summarized here. So if you have until time t uh, an observation, a set of observation OT, uh, then uh, for all parameter lambda that is different than the true parameter mu, Remember that the, the reward is A transpose times nu, but nu is not known. So for all lambda and for all events that is uh, FT measurable, so it means that it depends on the T first observation, the expected log likelihood ratio uh, of the observation with respect to mu and respect to lambda is bigger than the Kell divergence <coughs> between two Bernoulli distribution of parameter P mu of E and P mu or P lambda of E, where E is a measurable event. So uh, if you look at what we have, you can essentially uh, see that the expected log likelihood ratio is explicit in our case, and it's gonna be equal to mu minus lambda transpose, the expected covariate matrix, uh, sum of S, over time of AS, AS transpose, where AS is the action that you select at time S, times mu minus lambda, and uh, divided by two sigma square. Okay. 
So this inequality is true for all lambda and for all event E. So now uh, in the second step, we are exploiting the fact that the algorithm is delta pack. Delta pack means that it's adaptive. So it means that uh, the algorithm works well for the parameter mu, the true parameter mu, but also for the parameter lambda. Okay. And uh, we select the event E such that uh, the algorithm is not returning the best arm for mu. So if under mu, the algorithm makes a mistake. Okay. So um, uh, if we take a lambda that is what we say confusing, it means that the best arm is not the same best arm as under the parameter mu. Then we know that the probability uh, of the event E under mu is smaller than delta because the algorithm is delta pack. But if lambda uh, leads to a best arm that is different than under the parameter mu, this event must be very likely under lambda. And it must be bigger than 1 minus delta, again, by definition of the delta pack algorithm. Okay. So and at, uh, if you plug all this in, in this inequality, you get this inequality, uh, which is the, expect, uh, the expected sample complexity times this function is bigger than KL delta 1 minus delta. Okay. Uh, the term uh, WA here can be interpreted as the proportion of time you play action A. And it's referred to as the allocation of the algorithm. Okay. Okay. Um, so that leads to the uh, sample complexity lower bound. Um, that was actually present in the thesis of SOAR in 2015. For any delta pack algorithm, we have the sample complexities bigger than two sigma square. Sigma is the variance of the noise times a constant times essentially log one over delta. This constant is the inverse of this uh, uh, sup mean problem. We have the supremum over the allocation. Okay, so sigma is a simplex. And then we have this function here. So uh, actually, uh, if you call this function here, psi of mu w, um, we can actually prove that psi is continuous in mu and w. Uh, and then its maximum is also continuous. And essentially, the optimal allocations here that realize this supremum are, uh, is a convex, compact, and non-empty set. So there are, a couple, there are a lot of optimal allocations or op optimal sampling or arm selection strategy that would actually realize this supremum and that would lead to an optimal algorithm. Of course, this optimal allocation will depend on new so, but uh, then uh, we are hopeful because we can try to design an algorithm that is tracking the allocation, the optimal one of the allo uh, optimal allocation. And so, this is what we do uh, essentially. Uh, we have a track and stop algorithm that first uh, estimates the parameter mu using the least square estimator. The least square estimator of mu uh, is explicit and depends on the covariate matrix. Um, and we actually will prove that uh, it has good error um, when the smallest uh, eigenvalue of the covariate matrix is bigger than something, is lower bounded by something. For the sampling rule, uh, we, are, we are going to first ensure that this uh, smallest eigenvalue is large enough because we want that our estimator is good and is actually converging, is consistent. Okay, so uh, this uh, requirement we call it forced exploration, and then we are going to track uh, the best allocation. Okay, so the sampling rule will be essentially composed by these two, these two, or satisfy these two requirements. And then we will have a stopping rule that is based on the classical uh, generalized log likelihood uh, ratio test with an appropriate threshold. 
the challenge is to make all these procedures uh, independent of k, uh, the number of arms. So when it comes to uh, the least square estimator, the, we can ex essentially, we have a very explicit formula for the error of the least square estimator. And it's strongly depending on the, the speed of growth of the covariate matrix. Okay. So you see that the growth of this uh, covariate matrix is uh, really dictating the, the error rate. So we can actually uh, decompose the error rate as follows, okay, um, which is convenient because the first term here is what we called a self-normalized process that was essentially well studied, uh, introduced in the book by Pena, Lai, and Xiao in 2009. And uh, the first uh, one to apply this uh, framework or this theory to linear uh, bandit was uh, the work of Abbasi Yaktori et al. in 2011. But anyway, what is very nice with this self-normalized process is that you can derive concentration inequalities. And this is one of them that will allow us to essentially derive the performance uh, of, the, of the least square estimator. So actually, we can show that the least square estimator provided that uh, the uh, smallest eigenvalue of the uh, covariate matrix grows as c to t to the power alpha, the error of the least square estimator will be bigger than epsilon uh, with probability at most this. So you see it's exponential in t. And uh, so it's really a, a nice concentration result and a very precise evaluation of the performance of the least square estimator. So now, for, uh, now of course, the least square estimator has good properties if uh, the smallest eigenvalue of the covariate matrix is bigger than c to the power t alpha. And so uh, we need in the sampling rule when we select sequentially the arms to force this condition. And uh, the idea is to take a subset of arms that span completely Rd, uh, so that if I, if I sum over the arms of this subset, I get um, a covariate matrix that is of lambda mean strictly positive. So if I select t times all these arms, then I have a lambda mean that will essentially uh, scale as t. Okay, so that will be for the force exploration. For the tracking, we will uh, denote by WT a sequence whose distance to the optimal allocation decays as uh, to zero almost surely. So uh, we will, of course, apply the certainty equivalence principle because we know that the least square estimator would have we know that u hat t will converge to mu. And so by continuity and uh, arguments, we know that c star of mu hat t will be close to c star of mu. So if we track an allocation that is in c star mu hat t, this would, we hope that this is enough. So uh, as a result, the arm selection strategy is as follows. If uh, the, the, eigen, the smallest eigenvalue of the covariate matrix is smaller than square root of t, then I force the exploration. I try to increase this uh, smallest eigenvalue. And if it's not the case, if I'm good with this, it means that the mean square, the least square estimator would be good. Then I will track uh, the, the optimal allocation. Okay. That's very, that's rather simple. For the stopping rule, uh, we will apply generalized log likelihood ratio. I, I will not spend too much time on this, but essentially ZABT is the log likelihood of arm A to be bigger, to be better than arm B. And based on this random variable ZAB, I can form ZT, which will tell me, well, uh, the, the level of certainty that I will have on the best empirical arm. And I will stop uh, when this uh, random variable zt exceeds the threshold. Uh, this is rather classical, 
What is not classical is the choice, uh, the choice of the threshold that does not depend on K and that is uh, really tuned so has to uh, meet our requirements. So the main result in this part is that the track and stop algorithm is delta pack and it's, uh, it's almost sure sample complexity satisfies uh, is smaller than what we have in the lower bound. Uh, almost surely and in expectation when delta goes to zero. So it's asymptotically optimal and its implementation is scale-free, does not depend on the number of arms. All right, so here is uh, the numerical experiment. Here we took- So actually, Alexander, a quick yeah. question before. So this, uh, you, you're saying that the result says it's asymptotically optimal as delta goes to zero. So what happens if in the case of if um, so, what would it take, or what type of algorithm would give you uh, optimality for every delta, or, or you don't? Is that too hard a problem in some? But sense? it's 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 too hard. Uh, so okay. essentially, it's a, it's a very difficult problem. Yes. So you see that here we rely on very on very involved concentration result. And uh, we, we put them together very, it's very delicate in a sense. So if you want to have a finite time analysis, you could try to look at what the concentration result gives you. But uh, the second terms, the, the non-asymptotic terms are really tricky to handle. And there is no. There, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. No, I understand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So, uh, but uh, numerically, at least, it works very, very well. Um, so this is uh, the many arm example that everyone is is having, and the state of the art uh, was a paper by uh, Fies et al. in two, 2019 and Europe's. It's called Rage. Um, and um, so this is the performance of rage in terms of sample complexity compared to ours. Um, so we really outperform the, the existing algorithm. Uh, we even outperform some algorithm where uh, we give the algorithm the optimal allocation. So imagine I give you the optimal allocation, then you can uh, build up your stopping criteria and uh, so, well, our stopping rule is very well because we are even beating Oracle algorithms that know uh, the, optimal, uh, the optimal allocation, the optimal sampling rule. All right, uh, we have surprisingly a similar story. Oh, in a the question there yeah. actually on that, but you said there are multiple, I mean, there are many sampling rules that will work. Right. So when you say the Oracle has an optimal sampling rule, which which rule are you giving? I mean, there must one be one of them. We don't care. Yes. It doesn't matter which one. Okay. There is no best uh, sampling rule. In no, some no, 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 no. They would yield the same sample complexity uh, in a, in a, in average. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Alexandria. I also have a uh, related question. So in the experiment, uh, have you also looked into like uh, some other one, like a linear UCB? Uh, so linear UCB is to minimize regret typically, okay? So it's Yeah, like, I mean, uh, I know the objective is different, but yeah. if we you compare your algorithm with linear UCB in terms of sample complexity, uh, I don't know, have you looked at that? No, but linear UCB, you see, will be very bad in terms of sample complexity because you care about the exploitation. So you will, you, will, you will choose an arm that is empirically best most of the time. But this arm, we, we know it very well, in a sense, you know. Mm -hmm. So uh, here we really, uh, it's an explore, a pure exploration process. So you know, if you want to optimize uh, your experience, your cumulative experience, you know that you are going to pick most of the time the best empirical uh, item, arm. And this is bad for sample complexity because you don't need to sample this guy because you know it's you know it's good already. You see, but it isn't like the objective of minimizing the regret is also try to identify the best arm, right? Because uh, no, no, uh, no, 
Uh, if you spend too much time on the, let's say, second best arm, then you increase the regret. Isn't exactly. That? So the regret is the number of times you spend with suboptimal arm. Mm -hmm. Sample complexity is the number of time. <laughs> is that is the the total time? Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so we have a similar story for a continuous uh, set of arms, but it's much more difficult, but at least we have a scaling with respect to the dimension um, and the vector, the size of the vector uh, with respect to epsilon and with respect to delta. But I won't tell you about it. Uh, it's a bit, mm, bit complicated, but then I want to say a few words about linear system identification, which is a very classical problem in control. So you have a linear system that is unknown. Xt plus one is equal to Xt plus noise. The noise is Gaussian uh, or isotropic. Uh, and um, we want to estimate the system, uh, the, the, the system dynamics A or the matrix giving the system dynamics A from an observed trajectory of the system X0, Xt. Okay, so the sample complexity here is defined as the number of observation such that uh, there you have a, an estimator of A that is uh, very, clo uh, very close to A uh, epsilon uh, that is epsilon away from a with with high probability one minus delta so it's a let's say <coughs> epsilon delta pack framework so the objective is to design an estimator with minimal sample complexity given an accuracy and a confidence level epsilon and delta <clears throat> and we want to be problem specific it means that we want to find the minimal sample complexity and we want to find its dependence with respect to the matrix A, epsilon and delta and the dimension. So there have been a lot of work recently uh, about this topic. Uh, essentially, uh, well, the asymptotic properties of classical estimator, like least square estimator are, are known since the 70s. Um, but uh, what people have trying to try to look recently is the finite time analysis of these estimators and trying to really find what the sample complexity of linear system identification. So these are the results from the, the literature. Uh, there is a paper by Farond, Faradon B, Stewari and Mikhailidis in 2018 which has actually the wrong scaling in epsilon, delta, and A, and the dimension. So it's, 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 it's very rough. Then there is a paper at Col 2018 by Simchovitz, Maniatu, Jordan, and Resht. And uh, they have, unfortunately, an expression for the sample complexity for the least square estimator that is not explicit. Uh, and it's and there is a, 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 a paper also by Sarkar and Rackling, 2019, where essentially they didn't get it right when it comes to the dependency of the matrix A and the dimension. So what we wanted to do is that we want to have an explicit and optimal dependence for the sample complexity in delta, epsilon, and A and the dimension. And as usual, we did it from scratch, uh, starting with an instance specific sample complexity lower bound. So now you know the technique, so I can be very brief, but we do exactly the same as I, I, pro I showed in the linear, uh, in linear bandit optimization. And again, the expected log likelihood ratio can be really uh, given explicitly. Uh, it's uh, it's related to the matrix A, to the, the other matrix A prime. Uh, this is the change of measure argument and the cumulative uh, finite time controllability gramian of the system. So it's a matrix that is classical in control theory and uh, it appears here naturally in the expected log likelihood ratio. And um, when we consider epsilon delta pack algorithm, 
then we can optimize over A prime as we did for lambda in the best arm identification. And we can prove uh, the following uh, lower bound. Uh, it's a bit tricky, there are, there are intermediate steps, but at the end of the day, we get this theorem. So for any A, for any epsilon and delta, the sample complexity tau of any estimator, that is delta pack, uh, should uh, satisfy this uh, inequality, which says that the minimum eigenvalue of the cumulative uh, controllability gradient of the system should be bigger than one over epsilon square log one over delta, essentially. Okay. So it's a very simple formula and it's kind of uh, nice. If you want to have a, a looser but explicit lower bound, you can uh, transform this, uh, you, you can uh, transform this lambda mean using a, a scalar function. Uh, if you introduce this function phi a, uh, you can show that <clears throat> the lower bound looks like this. This function of the sample complexity is bigger than one over two epsilon square log one over delta. Okay. All right. Um, but anyway, so we have a lower bound. Now we would like to know whether the least square estimator reach this lower bound. Is it optimal? And uh, what is nice with the least square estimator, maybe some people know it, is that again, it's completely explicit. Huh? It's exactly like in the linear bandit. We have, uh, it's, a, it's a function of the covariate matrix or the inverse of it. And we also have an explicit expression for the error, a t minus a, and this is it. So, and again, we have the covariate matrix here that uh, appears naturally. All right, so here I'm going to assume that uh, the system is stable and I'm, I'm going to put everything in uh, matrix notations so that to simplify. So the covariate matrix is X, capital X, and the noise matrix, capital E. <clears throat> so what we have proved uh, essentially, or Yassir managed to prove, and this was essentially open, so it's a very strong result, I think is that for any delta, for any confidence uh, parameter, and for any accuracy parameter, so it's what Vijay asked before, I mean, is it asymptotic or not? Here it's for all delta and epsilon. We have that the least square estimator is epsilon delta pack as long as the following condition holds. And here you recognize almost the lower bound that we had in the, in the previous theorem modulo uh, this additional uh, dimension here and this term here, <coughs> this, this term here. Okay, um, so essentially if epsilon and delta are small, uh, the ordinary least square estimator is optimal because this would dominate over the dimension and epsilon square much better than this, this, uh, this uh, matrix here. So this, this uh, theorem is actually establishing a conjecture uh, in the paper, in the cold paper 2018 that I mentioned earlier. Okay, I have very few uh, minutes left to mention how we prove this, but at the heart of this uh, result, we manage actually to have a full description uh, of a full concentration result on the entire spectrum of the covariate matrix X um, as a function of the cumulative controllability gradient of the system. So M is the one over square root of the cumulative uh, controllability gradient. And we prove that as the, all the singular values of the covariate matrix SD, S1 of X are bounded by this upper and lower bounded by this with probability uh, that is uh, essentially exponent, exponentially high. Okay. Uh, what it says is that uh, it says a lot because essentially when T goes large, we know that this guy would, tend, would be approximately T. 
So M is scaling as one over square root of T, if you like, okay? So uh, we know the concentration result that we have says that the minimum singular value and the maximum singular value of X of the covariate matrix would scale as square root of T. And this is just a numerical experiment to, 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 to show you this, uh, where we have normalized, renormalized the singular values of X uh, by one over square root of T. So what we establish, and I think it's a very strong result because it's, it could be very useful in many, many questions, for many questions in control, is that the covariance matrix has a spectrum that is highly concentrated around square root of T. And based on this concentration result, we managed to essentially establish the performance of the least square estimator uh, using, uh, again, a lot of uh, arguments from uh, random matrix theory. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I, I have no time left to enter the detail, but we can discuss it if you like. So to conclude, I would like to say that uh, linear models seems a bit dull. Uh, they're actually very rich uh, in terms of research question. Uh, what we were able to show you here is instance specific optimal best action or best system identification for this system. So it's rather strong result. And what is very nice to me, and uh, this is one of the things that excites me the most is that at the core of the analysis, we have to analyze the spectrum of random matrices that are built from these dynamical systems. And I think one of the nice uh, things that we, we are trying to do now is, is to do the same thing for Markovian systems. All right, I'll stop here and... Uh... All right, thanks a lot, Alexander. So I'm, I'm going to... Uh... So if you can stop sharing, I'll share my screen a little yeah. bit and then we can uh, go to more broader questions. I will take up some of the other questions that you had in mind as well. So uh, just wait, hold on. <laughs> okay, so. All right, so thanks again for a great uh, talk. So I have, I mean, I'm just gonna summarize your results, but I mean, you already did a great job of presenting it. So. Uh, so the, at the high level, and since least squares estimates works well for all these linear problems, both in the linear system identification linear systems and the best term identification linear bandits. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, you sh it's the, as you mentioned, in the linear system estimation problem, the least squares estimate is the ML estimate um, but in the Gaussian case and asymptotic convergence is well known. What, uh, what you've been able to characterize as uh, lower bounds and sample complexity. And with and without control, there's a follow-up paper where you can get the lower bounds with, uh, with control. And in the uncontrolled case, there you can show that under certain conditions, you achieve the lower bound as well, <laughs> or very close to the lower bound. Uh, in the linear banded uh, problem, uh, a particular forced exploration with general sampling mechanism is shown to achieve the lower bound and sample complexity. So, so here are my questions in some sense. <laughs> so actually I should have put the linear bandits first and then the least squares, so least mm -hmm. linear system. So maybe I will talk about the bottom first and then the, mm -hmm. um, so in some sense, if I look at a lot of, uh, I mean, the change of measure ma approach that you mentioned, yeah. it strongly uses the fact that you have a Gaussian, um, uh, Gaussian noise. Absolutely. Yeah. And, uh, and so it, and a lot of the, so you know that it becomes, it comes down to looking at these covariance, covariant, covariate matrices, and then you can, you know what uh, the least squares make sense there. Mm -hmm. and for example, in that problem, you can actually, uh, you know what uh, allocation to track. Yeah. What happens if that's not the case? You have other, other sub Gaussian distributions, which the likelihood ratio is not that um, easily uh, amenable to analysis. Yes, so uh, yeah, this is a uh, yeah, this is the main issue with the approach in a sense that if you if I summarize the approach, uh, we as <clears throat> we derive a, a lower bound, 
the lower bound is a solution of a problem optimization problem. And we need in some sense to solve this optimization problem to be able to characterize this allocation and to track it, to devise the optimal algorithm. So it's true that when we have um, Gaussian noise, uh, in a sense, uh, the optimization problem becomes explicit and you can solve it and it's very nice. So uh, my guess is that, uh, first of all, it's going to work for um, exponential families of uh, random variable or one, one parameter exponential family because mm -hmm. you have similar formulas as in Gaussian you can actually characterize the expected log likelihood ratio. If you have now a generic, uh, a generic sub Gaussian distribution, I'm not sure, but uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> I'm trying to uh, tell you uh, what, what we are doing right now is try to get rid of solving this optimization problem uh, finding the optimal allocation uh, in every iteration or periodically. So what you could do is that anyway, you can, you can write the optimization problem and maybe you just need to have an idea of doing a gradient step for this optimization problem. Instead yeah, that's what I was going to ask. To yeah, solve... could you, do you have to actually solve it or can you actually uh do it in some sort of uh, So I think that there, there is a much simpler implementation that would work and we are working on this, where instead of solving an optimization problem in each step, if you want to do, uh, if you want to track uh, the optimal allocation for mu hat t, okay, you could just do a kind of gradient descent. Um, and uh, of course, the, the algorithm becomes extremely simple computationally because uh, most of most of the case, the, the gradient step is much, it's, it's just one, one step that you could use to solve the optimization problem. Mm -hmm. And I guess that we can prove similar results. So that's, uh, that's, uh, that's promising and, and, and trying to really, maybe it's, it's, a, it's a good direction to solve problems where the optimization problem with let's say sub Gaussian distributions are not amenable to explicit uh, formulas. But uh, we are working on this and we are not there yet. Okay. <laughs> so the follow up question on that same thing was in the continuous case you had, I mean, you, you didn't talk about it so much in your assumption, but it was yeah. mentioned in your algorithm that you, that the sampling thing was you, I mean, the first exploration was using a set of arms that was a basis for our, uh, Right. So what happens if that actions do not, I mean, they're, they're in a lower dimensional. Yeah. So, but nothing happens. <laughs> That's okay. It. So essentially if, if you're, uh, we, you can restrict yourself to the, the dimension to a, pro, to a system with a dimension that is equal to that the dimension of the space. Uh, ah, okay. So it's just, it's just, a, oh, it doesn't matter too much. Okay. Right. Because, yeah, it doesn't matter. You don't need to, uh, you don't need to uh, estimate the coordinates that are not spanned and the, the coordinate of mu that are not spanned by any action, right? Okay. So That's it right. doesn't change much. I mean, you can, you have to re redefine a little bit things, but it's more or less the same thing. So, okay, now the other question that I had were for the other problem that you yeah. uh, towards which you presented towards the end. One is a, I think a simpler question is, so your, uh, your, I mean, you had in your CDC 2019 paper, you had a, um, a lower bound, uh, yeah. even when control inputs are allowed. And, yeah. uh, but in your current analysis that you presented, when you're achieving the lower bound, you basically do not look at a system with control input. So what happens if you, um, how does least squares perform in, if control inputs are yeah, yeah. as well? So th this has been a, an open question, uh, a very important open question, because if you are able to solve this question, like how the least square estimator behaves when you have control, then you would probably be able to solve the, 
the finding the best regret possible in LQR system. Okay. Which uh, people have been working a lot recently and having bad results. I have uh, I, I could talk about this, but essentially they are all cheating. Uh, yeah, I mean, I uh, to, you to don't need to. Why, I mean, I'm, but, I'm on the same page. I think. On that. <laughs> but uh, so actually, we are working on this, and now I think uh, the main idea, you know, is that um, essentially, uh, if you if you understand what I what I, the analysis that we did is that essentially the the spectrum of the covariate matrix does everything. Okay. So uh, now uh, we have an analysis where essentially uh, we you can show that the least square estimator, if you if you um, uh, if you follow let's say the certainty equivalence controller uh, would uh, would uh, yield the um, smallest eigenvalue for the covariate matrix that is growing as t which is uh, essentially saying that the least square estimator would perform well, okay? Okay. So uh, everything is tied up to the smallest eigenvalue of the covariant matrix. And the problem now is that, well, you can prove or you can ensure that uh, you, even if you do certain T equivalence, then you have this lower bound for the smallest eigenvalue. And that's what, my, what Yasir is trying to do right now. I guess that's related to my next question in some sense. If you if you did certainty equivalence with system, I mean system identification and you did, you did certainty equivalence for the control, mm. you could run into this. I mean, this is a classical problem. I, if my colleague Demos was uh, still on the, he hadn't retired, he would bring this up first. Uh, yeah. So you have this old uh, identification issues where the ML estimate will converge, but may not may converge to an incorrect estimate. And um, yeah, I mean one. Cool. I mean one way people have looked at there. I mean you seem to be saying that you can still work with an ML estimate, but um, they've also looked at biased maximum likelihood estimators where you can. I mean you know the problem, so you can throw the value function in. Um, I mean, based on the parameters, you can calculate the value function for this linear thing. It, mm -hmm. And you just sort of bias the estimate a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, and that can asymptotically, I mean, it's so shown to work well. And I think there is some, you know, at least in banded cases, they're able to look at regret of these type of estimators. I, um, see, I see. That's a very interesting. Uh, so this is the kind of work that Kumar had from in the 80s, and uh, I mean, 70s and 80s. Kumar had a bunch of things of, uh, you take the, I think you you uh, take the value function and then you raise it to the power of uh, like log of t or something, or the minus log of t, you bias it appropriately so that your estimator, when you're forming the estimator, you, you take that into account. Mm -hmm. So what, what people have been doing in linear system to solve LQR and with minimal regret is that they typically assume that <clears throat> if there is a problem, uh, it means that the, pro the system is uh, then you stop uh, the certainty equivalence and you move back to a, you move back to a very simple control, let's say just a stabilizing control, so that okay. the, so the, the system goes down in temperature and then uh, you can start again the certain, certainty equivalence principle. But uh, that's that's a very interesting uh, topic. Yeah. But, yeah. So I guess well, a few other questions that you said you had, uh, maybe these are worth discussing was more with uh, uh, these are sort of broader topics in a way, is comparison say with sample complexity and regret and um, min max and the uh, instance bound. Maybe you have a few comments before I yeah. open it up for other questions, just to get a... So essentially, if you if you derive a lower bound for mini uh, for sample complexity of regret, it's exactly the same method, except that a delta pack algorithm would be uh, in for the regret it would be a uniformly good algorithm, which says that uh, essentially the regret is smaller than square root of t, for example. Mm -hmm. But 
it's exactly the same optimization problem. But uh, when you look at the optimization problem for regret, you assume that you know the best arm. And you know, you know the value of the best arm because uh, this is uh, because the, al the algorithm is uniformly good. So we, you know, you assume that the algorithm will eventually pick the best arm most of the time. Yeah. Okay? So it means that you know the value of this best arm and you know it very precisely statistically. Actually, you know it exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so in the optimization problem leading to the lower bound for regret, you have an additional information about the best arm. And this is why this optimization problem is much more complex in the sample complexity case. Yeah, uh, that's true. So, uh, uh, if, I, uh, if I may interrupt, uh, yeah. I'm not quite sure what you mean, like you know exactly the best arm. Yeah. Like, uh, in a linear bandit case, right? Or the baseline is used to calculate regret, but the algorithm actually does not know the best arm. Yeah. So you, you don't know the best arm, but you know. Uh, it's uh, so uh, yeah. That's that's. Uh, let's see. Let's see. How to explain this? Um, yeah, that's a good point. Um, so in the classical bandit, yes, the regret is the sum of. Uh, over time of the, the average reward of the best arm minus the average reward of your arm, okay? Right. With the, the time, the number of time you, you pick suboptimal arms times the generated regret. Mm -hmm. for, the, for, the, for the optimization problem, the optimization problem is about the, about the number of times you pick certain arms, okay? Since right. in the since the objective function for the optimization problem of the regret, you don't have the number of time you pick the best arm because this generates no regret. It means that there is absolutely no constraints on this number. Okay, yeah, that's, that's, true. that's true. Right, right, right. So basically, when you use the best arm, there's no cost. There is no cost, and so you don't care about this guy. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. In the sample complexity, you care about all, all arms. Because everyone, each time you pull an arm, you have a cost minus one. Okay. So because yeah. it's time that you're optimizing. I see. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. And so the second sort of thing, broader discussion was between min-max uh, and instance-specific. Um, yeah. So yeah, yeah. So so yeah, there are a lot of papers about. Uh, uh, recently, re reinforcement learning, and uh, let's say, what is the what is the regret of Q learning, for example, with UCB exploration? And uh, there are a lot of papers saying that oh, uh, the algorithm is reaching a square root of T regret. Uh, so it means that the the algorithm is is efficient. Because square root of t regret is kind of the minimum uh, lower bound for regret as well. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I pretend that this is absurd to say that because actually uh, we can generally get log t regret, and uh, and the square root of t regret is something generally that you can achieve in adversarial scenarios where the statistical model is changing at every step. Mm -hmm. So there are papers about adversarial RL where you can do that. Uh, you can reach these regrets even if the system is changing in an adversarial manner every single step. So you understand that this, this square root of t regret, for example, is a very is a much is, is too high threshold or too high target. It's not good enough uh, because this is what you can have. That when the system is changing all the time. So it has nothing to do with statistical today, efficiency of your algorithm. Right. That's what mm -hmm. I mean. Hey, uh, again, I have a follow-up question on that. Uh, so, I mean, I agree with what you, what you said. 
Uh, a quick question. So for linear bandits, uh, are you aware of any uh, problem dependent lock T bound for linear bandits? <clears throat> yes. So there are there are problems. Uh, yes. Can you stay with yeah, the there are lock T regret. So there are two things. Okay. So yeah. um, you get the lock T regret suddenly when there is a positive gap between the best and the second best action. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is no positive gap, unfortunately, you have to pay a third of the regret. Right, so if it's a continuous, then it seems the best you can get is for T. It depends. Uh, sometimes you get log T. Uh, so th there are some papers where they have what we call the margin condition, where essentially uh, you make sure that there is a, some kind of gap that is helping you to learn. Okay. But again, I, I would not say that this square root of t regret in continuous setting is. Uh, you you still uh, so what we do in the in the paper with linear bandit is we have we have uh, I think for the first time a problem specific lower bound that is uh, for the continuous action case. Generally, you have get a minimax lower bound because when you have a continuous set of action, it's very difficult actually to, to drive a lower bound. That's our problem. Yeah, no, that's uh, I feel uh, find it extremely interesting. It seems suggests uh, even if the, if the action set is continuous, uh, if you use uh, like the conventional wisdom from linear uh, from bandit, this thing suggests you cannot get problem independent bound. You only get third two. But what you're saying is that still there's a possibility to get a better bound than third. That's that's very no, no. So, so the bound on square root t is unavoidable. It's a very well known stuff for uh, even quadratic function, quadratic. Uh, Quadratic bandit, or convex bandit with quadratic uh, function, for example. And this is known for linear bandit as well. Yes. But, but then, what do you mean, like, a, like, a, so in that case, is that like the min max bound is also good? Uh, good no, but so the min max is generally over a big set of models, big set of problems. Okay. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that when you, uh, if, you there is a, an alternative approach to try to reduce uh, what, what we want when we do problem specific is that we reduce the sets to one point, the model of interest. What you could do is to try to reduce the set over which you do your mean max to a reasonable set. Okay, so for example, people have been looking at mean max bounds for bandit with a given gap, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and and uh, what I'm saying is that we know that the lower bound is square root of t for the class of quadratic functions, which is a small class of convex function, if you want. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, but this the fact that it's square root of t doesn't doesn't uh, forbid you to look at problem specific bounds. Okay, even if it's the same scaling in t. The constants that are in front are very important. And yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So, any other questions from? Um, if not, let me thank Alexander again for a very nice talk. Sorry, only. Uh, so we, uh, you're meeting with a few people on Monday. So I think. Uh, Shelly should send you the schedule sometime, and it's on a. It's using Gather Town, and it'll be a slightly different. No, but I have the. I have the schedule actually. I have All the right, schedule. great. Okay. All right. Wonderful. Thanks. Have a good weekend, and I'll talk to you on Monday then. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Bye. Have a good weekend to you all. all right. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Bye. bye.